Maybe I did. Yeah, okay. I think you did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, spend the week talking about various things r uh, related to mostly mean curvature flow. Um, I'm going to, so today's lecture will be ODE methods. Um, there will be a lot of ODEs uh, during the week. Um, so in, in mean curvature flow, there is, um, uh, there's a lot of general theory, which is uh, for for some for a large group of people, the uh, the goal is to to take a smooth initial surface and to flow it to see what kind of singularities it forms, uh, to do something with those singularities to flow on, uh, and maybe prove topological theorems. Uh, other applications uh, for with mean curvature flow are uh, come from mathematical physics. You have some sort of model, and you're trying to construct a uh, a more robust theory where uh, the initial surface can be smooth or it doesn't have to be smooth and there will be singularities but you want something, you want it to, just, uh, to have a, a nice way of uh, constructing generalized solutions that pass through these singularities. Um, and there, so there are various theories, uh, so Takis was talking about those this morning. Um, what I, uh, much of what I'm going to do will be uh, constructing examples of solutions. Um, examples of uh, what singularities can look like if you have formed a singularity, uh, how to continue the flow in some sort of smooth, some sort of smooth way, there are, uh, what kind of things can you run into. Um, and so I will not be producing uh, general theorems, but uh, a lot of examples. And uh, many of these examples are easier. It is, uh, so in a sense, if, you, if you've ever talked to a number theorist or an algebraist, uh, and you're an analyst, uh, after a while there's, you will get a sense of jealousy because, um, because they have a problem and they say Fermat's problem, right? So, which was a very hard problem, but uh, is it true? Well, you just do examples, right? You calculate the first, you test it for the first thousand integers, uh, or the first million integers, right? So you can do all these computations and they give you an idea of whether something might be true or not. Uh, with something like mean curvature flow, all these geometric flows, you cannot just try the first 10 surfaces, right? There's, that doesn't exist. So constructing examples is, is a more intensive, uh, yeah, more labor intensive uh, enterprise. Um, and so that's what I want to show you this week are uh, a lot of examples. Um, so <clears throat> first let me begin with, uh, so a lot of the examples will be elementary. Uh, there's going to be a fair amount of calculus. Uh, I'll try to keep the amount of the number of uh, actual calculations and, and uh, you know, computations and formulas uh, to a minimum, but they, they will show up. Uh, so let me start with, um, begin with uh, mean curvature flow for graphs. And uh, let me start with the simplest uh, version for curves in the plane. So I have a curve. I have a curve in the plane and I want to know uh, what equation, so it's the graph of a function of, uh, and so time is not in the picture of course. Uh, what equation should this thing satisfy for this curve to move by, uh, by mean curvature flow, which in the plane is curve shortening? Okay, so. Uh, so, mean curvature flow is the velocity is equal to the mean curvature, which for curves in the plane is just the curvature of the, of the curve. And now we have from, from calculus, we have formulas. What is the curvature of the curve? It is the second derivative It's that formula with that strange three halves in it. Uh, so that's the um, that's the curvature of the curve at this particular point. So that point actually is, looks like an inflection point. So the curvature there should be zero. Um, and now, what is the normal velocity? Well, if this thing is moving a little later, it'll be there. Then uh, the normal velocity would be this. Uh, but if you differentiate u with respect to time, you get that. 
So the normal velocity is the time derivative of u, but then you have to look at this little triangle that has the slope of the graph in it. And so the u dt has to be equal to, so that's, that's the equation for mean curvature flow for uh, curves. So then you can cancel this against that. So the That's the, uh, that's the PDE that the uh, solutions to curve shortening satisfy if they are graphs of functions. For, uh, so in, in higher dimensions, there's a similar calculation where I'll uh, not write the, um, won't do the calculation, but I'll, I'll write the, So if a graph of a function is moving by mean curvature flow, then mean curvature flow is equivalent with an equation like this thing. And so it's a parabolic equation, du dt is second derivative show up, and then there are coefficients, and I And the important thing for what I'm going to say today is that these coefficients, there's a formula for them, they only depend on the gradient of the function u. Okay, so now, unlike the equation uh, that Takis wrote for the level set flow, this equation, as long as ux is bounded, is non-degenerate. It's a non-degenerate parabolic equation, and there are off-the-shelf theorems that you can use to uh, conclude short time existence, and if you can bound the gradient, you get long time existence. Um, and there is, um, so, there is a uh, theorem of Ecker and Husken. So I'll write the equation like that. So this PDE has a unique solution with your, for arbitrary ellipses initial functions. And the solution exists for all positive time. It's Lipschitz constant is bounded. Um, and then they, they, they prove further theorems. You can, you, we, you can reduce the uh, condition of Lipschitz continuous to being arbitrarily continuous. And there's some interest that, uh, the, uh, the function doesn't have to be uniformly continuous, and it doesn't need to require any growth conditions at infinity, which you should contrast with uh, the standard linear heat equation, where you can, uh, you can start the, heat, uh, the, heat, the linear heat equation with really big initial data, but they do have to be bounded by some e to the a x squared at infinity. So for mean curvature flow, there is no such growth condition. You can take an arbitrary continuous function. Uh, it can grow arbitrarily fast at infinity. Um, all that is required is, is continuity. Okay, so a consequence of this is, um, so much of what I, so uh, my topic today is ODE methods for studying expanding and, and shrinking solutions to uh, mean curvature flow. Uh, the ecker huskin theorem, so a co consequence of this is, so consider the following situation. Suppose um, suppose the graph of our initial condition is a cone. Okay, so in other words, u naught is homogeneous of degree one.
Okay. Then um, then the uh, the solution has to be self similar. And why is this? Uh, well, so uh, for two reasons. One, uh, U is a solution. This implies that lambda times U, sorry, one over lambda. So this is the usual parabolic rescaling. Uh, you're allowed to trade one space uh, for two times, um, so for all positive lambda. And so for the graph equation, it's, uh, so for, for either that equation or this equation, if you like, um, it's a matter of just substituting. Uh, the, the important thing here is that this it's not the formula for these coefficients. The, the thing is that these coefficients only depend on the gradient of u. And if you take the gradient of this function, that lambda comes out and will cancel that lambda. So uh, rescaling here does not change the gradient. Okay, And then, then you have here one time derivative is equal to two space derivatives. And it's the usual uh, uh, parabolic scaling. Okay, So that's also a solution. Uh, on the other hand, If your solution has that cone as initial value, then um, then my rescaled solution, its initial value is one over lambda u not lambda x. Our rescaled solution has the same initial value, and then the uh, uniqueness part here is important. Okay, so the uniqueness tells me that the, the solution that we get satisfies that for all positive lambda, which is the definition of being self-similar. Um, okay, and now this means, so this is an example. It's an example of, a, of an expanding self-similar solution. And it's uh, not one example. It's a, um, it's, a it's a really large class of examples for each, for each Lipschitz function that, whose graph is a cone, for each ho uh, uh, homogeneous of degree one function, you get one of these things. Okay, So in particular, if I let um, curve shortening, if I take a V as initial condition, then there exists a self-similar expanding solution. And this one is called, was found by Bracke. Uh, so it's in his book on varifold solutions of all the stuff in this book. This is the most trivial thing in the book, but it is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of the pictures in the back. Um, so there's a, there's a one parameter, there's a, a self-similar solution that comes out of this. Okay, so the forward evolution of this cone is self-similar, and it's given by a particular uh, particular. Uh, so th this uh, the graph of this function. It's a solution to an ODE. Um, there's no explicit formula for it. You should think of this as the, an analog to the uh, self-similar solutions to the uh, to the heat equation. Um, this solution. Uh, so to Uh, yeah, to 
sort of continue what Takis was talking about. If you have, if you are thinking about evolving in forward time uh, a pair of crossing lines, then what can you do? Uh, you can say, well, this thing, it's the union of this and that, and those should evolve in forward time by just expanding outwards in a self-similar way. Or you could say it's the union of these two. And then in forward time, it should expand in this way. Or you could say they're both self-similar lines and they have curvature zero, so they don't move and they sit like that. That's another solution. Or you could say it's a network of curves. So there will be talks about this this week. Um, you could say it's a network of curves. So these are uh, smooth curves that come together. Uh, and the boundary condition, So each smooth part evolves by curve shortening. Uh, the boundary condition at the points where they meet is that these have to be equal angles. So these have to be, so which I, I this looks more like it. These, that one is a bit too small. Um, so there's, a, there's another evolution uh, forward from this uh, as, a, as a network. Um, there are at least two of them, and the, uh, the viscosity solution is the most robust thing. It, is, uh, it contains all of them. And in this particular case, the boundary of the, the viscosity solution is everything contained inside these smooth self-expanding uh, solutions. So all possible other solutions that you might imagine have to lie inside there. Right? And the question is, what is there inside there? Yeah. If we translate, yeah, the, 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 the first thing that you said is the thing is flat in the center, right? Yes. So it converges to a line after a translation and. Yes. Uh, not uniformly. Not uniformly, yeah. No, no, it's uh, right, yeah. Okay, so another, so another example in this vein is, um, suppose that you start with an actual cone. How does this evolve forward in time? Um, and so, one, so using this, uh, this construction, we can come up with at least one way of evolving this forward in time, namely, um, I think of this as the union of two Lipschitz graphs, right, where you have to, you have to look at it this way. The, um, this part is, it's the graph of a Lipschitz function, and there's going to be some, uh, some self-similar way of evolving this forward, right, given, given by this construction. And so there's one way of evolving this forward, so this thing expands out self-similarly in that direction. Uh, so at least there's at least one forward evolution, namely this thing splits into two parts and you get two caps and each are moving independently of each of the other uh, forward in time um, in a self-similar way. Okay. And now you may ask um, for the uh, for the cross, the two crossing lines. We had more than one way of evolving it forward in time. Uh, namely, you could decide decide how to split it up. Uh, can you do the same thing here? Okay. And so here, there's an asymmetry between um, between the inside, what is inside the cone, and what is outside the cone. Those are topologically different things. So if I connect things up this way, 
I would get something, you would get something that looks like a one-sheeted hyperboloid, whereas the evolution, forward evolution that we have now looks like a two-sheeted hyperboloid. So the question is, could there exist a one-sheeted hyperboloid evolving forward in time? Um, and here, um, so let's look at, Mean curvature flow for surfaces of revolution. Uh, so we'll simplify the problem drastically by looking at uh, symmetric surfaces. Um, so I take the graph of a function and I swing it around the x-axis and then I get a surface in uh, R3. Uh, so the question now is, if that surface is to move by mean curvature flow, What equation does our function u have to satisfy? And here, uh, let me, so you have to do a little geometry of surfaces. Uh, what is the mean curvature of this surface of revolution? Um, in general, the mean curvature is, so the mean curvature is not the average of the, it is the average of the principal curvatures, except if you work on mean curvature flow, then it's just the sum of the principal curvatures. Um, so, There are two principal curvatures. One is, um, so this surface, let's say you're at this point, and again, I, for some reason I picked the inflection point. Uh, there's, let me, let me pick this point. Uh, there's one curvature that is this. So there's a principal curvature direction that is uh, parallel to the axis of rotation. Uh, this is, so that's K1. And that, is just uxx over this one plus ux squared, three halves. Um, and then there's another principal curvature direction, namely if you go, per so the other one has to be perpendicular to this. So there's a principal curvature in that direction. Um, and so the radius of curvature would be this, except that's not perpendicular to the surface. The radius of curvature has to be measured perpendicular to the surface. So the radius of curvature would be this thing. So it's this, um, the radius of curvature is this, is this, uh, R, the radius is u, uh, but you have to project it onto this line so it becomes longer. No, sorry, you have to project it onto this line. It becomes shorter, so the, uh, You have to do this. And now you have to be careful with the signs. If I count um, my, the curvatures going down, I'll count those as being positive. For example, if you have a sphere, we want all the curvatures to be positive. Uh, then that means that uh, this K1 has to be positive when the second derivative is negative. And now this is the opposite curvature. Sorry. I'll, uh, so for me, a sphere with the outward unit normal has negative curvature, and I'm, I'm sort of unique in, in the literature with that convention. So we get a minus sign here. Okay, that's the mean curvature. And then what is the, uh, what is the normal velocity? The normal velocity is the same as from, from the previous picture. The normal velocity v is just ut over that square root 1 plus ux squared. And now, if you set those two things equal to each other, you find um, Okay, now if you have higher dimensional surfaces, this equation, uh, so in other words, if you take a one dimensional axis and you rotate in more dimensions around this so that the, so this circle now becomes an n minus one sphere, uh, you get the same equation except this 
coefficient 1 becomes an n minus 1. Uh, but for today, I'll just stick to the three-dimensional case. Okay, so, so this is the, uh, that's the PDE. It is pretty much the same as curve shortening, except we get this one extra term, and this term is very nice, except when u is zero, which is exactly when, uh, so if the surface, if this, uh, if the surface at some point becomes, approaches the, uh, the x, the rotation axis, which it can only do by becoming singular, um, then the equation uh, develops singularity. Okay, so question, uh, can we find self-similar solutions? And so what is a self-similar solution? A self-similar solution is, it'll be one of these. So a self-similar solution will be a solution of this particular form. So this thing is, um, so in other words, it satisfies the other way around. But if you assume that uh, the, this rescaling that I just wrote down before, that that doesn't change the solution. If you make this assumption, then that uh, turns out that that means that the solution has to be of this form, where this u now, uppercase u, is a function of only one variable. Okay, conversely, if I have a function of this type, um, then it could be a self-similar solution, but uh, the function u has to satisfy a certain condition. So the question is, when is this actually, when is a, a solution of this type, a function of this type, when is it a solution of that differential equation? So you just substitute it and you do the calculation and you find um, So this thing satisfies mean curvature flow if and only if u satisfies and there's a, there's a factor one half. And so if you differentiate this with respect to time, this expression shows up, and this plus minus is exactly the same as that plus minus. So what is the relevance of the plus or the minus? Um, so for plus, you get solutions that are defined for all positive times, and these are expanders. And minus, these are solutions that are defined for all negative times, and these are shrinking solutions. That's plus and minus, and, that's, and that plus minus is the same as here. Okay, so there are these two ODEs. If we, if we find solutions to those ODEs, we can look at the corresponding uh, surfaces, and um, they will give us examples of sh uh, shrinkers and expanders. In particular, if we uh, set the dimension equal to, so if you do the non-rotationally, uh, If you only look at graphs of functions, and you, so you go back to curve shortening, this term isn't here, and this term would be absent. If you solve this ODE, you put with a plus over there, one of the solutions that you find is this, uh, this curve of Bracke, right? So this Bracke curve is a solution of that ODE if you, if you delete this one over U term.
And so, uh, what expanders can we find? So we look at this differential equation with a with a plus sign, um, and so there's a theorem. So this was done by uh, David Chop, Tom Ilman, and myself. Um, So for any positive A, there's a unique solution of the expander OD, that's this thing with a plus sign, uh, with Okay, and it's better if I draw it. All our functions are functions where u is positive, so their graphs are in the upper half plane. Uh, the solution well, we're considering here are, and, and the OD is fine as long as you stay away from u is zero. Um, if, uh, if you start at a certain value a here, uh, there is a solution. And uh, so, the, and we have more things to say about the solution. There is a solution that is a, uh, that's that just follows from the existence theorem for ODEs. Okay, uh, there's nothing singular uh, near that point. So the existence of the, of, a sh of the solution on a short x interval is just follows from ODE existence. Um, if you replace x by minus x in this equation, you'll find that th this ux appears squared, so that doesn't change. And here x gets multiplied with the u dx, so that also doesn't change its sign. So this equation is invariant on the replacing x by minus x. So the solution that you get will be even. Uh, so it does this. It's defined for all positive x, and since it's even, it's defined for all x. Um, it's strictly increasing. And most importantly, it is asymptotic to a cone. Okay, we're not claiming that the solution is convex. Uh, for a lot of values of A, it is not convex. In fact, it crosses that cone very often, uh, or it, can cr it does occasionally cross that cone. And, and the proof of this theorem is, um, it's, it's sort of elementary. Um, let me just say one or two things. Uh, let me explain why the solution doesn't become singular, um, why the solution to the OD doesn't become singular. So you start, you have a solution that exists for a little bit, and now here I, I'm already drawing that it's, uh, that it's uh, curved upwards, so the basic thing is that if, uh, so the expander OD says, if ux is ever zero, then, if the x derivative is ever zero, then this denominator uh, just becomes one. That x ux go, becomes zero, and you find that ux x is positive. So at any point where on the graph that is horizontal, the thing is curved upwards. Uh, therefore, there can only be one such point, right? If you had two of them, there would, be have, there would have to be a maximum in between, and at that point, the graph would be curved upwards, which is silly. 
Uh, okay, so therefore, Okay, so then you have to show, okay, so that we, we know the solution is increasing, uh, then does it go on forever? Uh, so then you have to worry about various things, so can it, um, could the derivative become infinite? Could that happen? And here, um, that doesn't happen because for the expander ODE you have a plus sign here. So the one, one over you goes to the other side. Okay, so uh, if you step back and look at this equation and you worry, uh, so how big is this, what is the growth in UX for this? So for large values of, of uh, ux, this is roughly, there's ux squared multiplying that one. So it's roughly minus x over 2 ux cubed plus smaller stuff. Uh, if the derivative ever becomes large, this will be the biggest term around. And since there's a minus sign here, it's negative. So if the derivative ever tends to become large, uh, if it becomes too large, this will become negative and the rate at which the derivative grows as you go to the right uh, is negative, so it will go back down again. Okay, so this, um, this implies that ux is bounded as x goes to infinity. Okay, so then more arguments of that type show you that, uh, so that means that this can't happen. So that means that the thing is increasing, its derivative stays bounded, and that means that it has to go on forever. So there's a solution that exists for all positive uh, x. Um, okay, so then let me not do the proof of this uh, because it's all elementary ODE stuff. Um, so if you have such a solution, If you have such a solution, then it defines a self-similar solution to mean curvature flow. It is asymptotic to a cone. And it's symmetric. Okay, so the, uh, the corresponding solution to uh, mean curvature flow is uh, it's square root t, we're going forward in time, times u of x, and so I'll, I'll suppress the little a there. This is a solution to mean curvature flow. And so what it does, it is asymptotic to a cone. In particular, right, so, um, so I'm letting t go to zero. If, if I keep a fixed x and, and you let t go to zero, what happens to this? x over square root t goes to infinity. So I'm using, using this property. Right. 
right? This thing for large values of the argument is a times that argument plus little o of uh, a times that arg little o of that argument. And so this cancels against that, um, also against that. So for fixed x, this is just a a times x. Uh, so this is when x is positive. And now it also holds for negative x. Okay, so that, uh, so the solution does start from a cone and it's like a one-sheeted hyperboloid forward evolution of that cone. Um, I want to, so the following is, uh, these things have asymptotic expansions as uh, x goes to infinity. So you, you might ask, how fast does this thing approximate uh, the cone, and that's it's, it's sort of an esoteric question, but it is, um, since there are various solutions of this type, it, it, um, If, um, if you have a solution to the expander OD, and I'm so in the drawing, I'm assuming that the solution, it doesn't have to be one of the ones that I was talking uh, about here. If you take any solution of the expander OD that is defined at least um, after some particular x naught, and it is asymptotic to a cone, um, then it, uh, then you can improve this little o of one here. The rate at which it approaches the cone has to be this. And moreover, these coefficients a, b, c, and d don't depend on the solution. So b, c, and d. The coefficients uh, b, c, d, and so on, they only depend on the opening aperture, uh, the, the slope of, uh, the asymptotic slope of the cone. Uh, and so this, um, this actually has a PDE proof. So it has an ODE proof. Uh, the OD, ODE proof is, is long and straightforward. You just, uh, you, you linearize the equation that you have and you prove that you get one term and then you go back and then you prove that you get another term and you keep on going. Um, the, uh, the PD proof goes like this. Okay, this thing is, so uh, the ODE that we're solved, that this thing solves is the ODE for so, uh, expanding uh, solutions to mean curvature flow. And so um, if I look at uh, that graph and swing it around the x-axis, I get a surface, uh, a solution to mean curvature flow. It is defined whenever this quantity <coughs> is bigger than this x naught. It solves mean curvature flow. Um, if I let t go to zero, then this calculation that I did here 
This was for the special solutions that we had over there, but uh, all we used was this property. So uh, the initial value of this thing is Okay, and this convergence is nice as long as you stay away from x is zero. So if you take an interval, say a compact interval surrounding x is one, so it'll the convergence will be uniform in x if you if x is just say in that interval. The uh, U satisfies U satisfies this PDE. And um, one over u stay, is stays bounded because u uh, converges uniformly to ax, which stays strictly positive. Uh, right, because my solution is converging uniformly to this straight line, and as long as we stay away from x is zero, it's uh, uniformly bounded away from zero. Um, our ux is bounded. Um, this is a, uh, a nice quasi-linear parabolic equation. Uh, we have a bounded a solution that attains Let me call this thing expand, uh, you know, of mean curvature flow. It's a solution to uh, to mean to a non-degenerate parabolic equation. So in right, it is defined over here, and it has a limit as you go to zero. So that means that the solution by parabolic PDE theory. Um, So parabolic theory then says that the solution is as smooth as the initial data, and the initial data is AX, which is linear. This proof is simple because I allow, my to, I allow myself to say by parabolic theory and not go into, you know, take for granted what is, uh, what is hidden in these words. It is a smooth solution and it is smooth all the way down to t is zero because because the initial data is infinity smooth. Parabolic theory does not say that because the initial data is analytic, therefore the solution is analytic. Um, and the, so the, just to remind you, the standard example, that is the, the solution of the heat equation, e to the minus x squared over 4t.
If you take the, the fundamental solution of the heat equation and you extend it by zero for negative time, you get a solution that is C infinity smooth everywhere except at the origin, right? So this thing, this is an example of a solution to the heat equation that is C infinity but not analytic. As a function of time, it is never analytic. It, uh, it is not analytic at t is zero. Okay, so we cannot conclude, even though this thing is analytic, we can't conclude that the thing will be an analytic function of time. Okay, so however, we do have um, at x is one. This thing is Right, just by Taylor, um, you take the nth order Taylor expansion, uh, the function is equal to its nth order Taylor expansion plus a remainder term of order t to the n plus one. And now that's for u is equal to one at, uh, at one t, so we're evaluating the solution here. We're applying Taylor forward in that, on, this, on this particular segment. So we're evaluating the solution here at, uh, at x is one, sorry, um, yeah, at x is one. Um, so that expansion we can apply to this, right? So that expansion applies to this function u. So what does it say about this one? Well, I said x equal to one. And now I'll set, um, having done this, I will, uh, so let's set square root of t is, um, let, let this be x. So x is one over, so t is one over x squared. And what you get is, Okay, I multiply, I divide by square root t on this side, that's the same as multiplying with x. I get x times, and here I get u at uh, one, zero times plus uh, ut at one, zero times t, that's, uh, that's one over x squared, plus, and then I get the second derivative at one, zero, Okay. And if you multiply this out, you get exactly this expansion. And the, uh, so this coefficient is that, this coefficient is that, this coefficient, that's our C. So you can calculate these things explicitly, and how do you calculate them? Well, for instance, for instance UT10 is, uh, Initially, u is equal to a times x. Okay, so I use this to calculate the first derivative. Well, the second, so to calculate all this, the first time derivative. This becomes zero. You get, um, I get minus one over, um, minus one over u at zero at one zero, which is minus one over a. Okay, if you want to get the second time derivative, differentiate this with respect to t, and just keep on computing. Right, so you can, using this, you can calculate all these time derivatives, and the only thing you need to know is this number a. So in particular, the next, the next term in this expansion, b only depends on a, and I just computed what it is, it's minus one over a. 
and then CD, the, the formulas are not very simple. They, they, they get complicated as you calculate more and more of them. Um, what this shows is that any solution is, uh, it is how do, so this shows that all these expanders approach the cone uh, concavely. Okay, so let's go back to, uh, so let's summarize. What, what do we have so far? Okay, so let's assume we have a cone and it is, uh, its opening angle is uh, it's given by y. The radius is a times x, where a is the, uh, the asymptotic slope of one of the self-expanders that I found before. Then uh, what, uh, which ways forward do we have? Uh, so there are two forward evolutions. One is... Um, Split it into two caps. Has two, has forward, self similar. So, so the ones I'm talking about are all self similar. There might be others. Uh, and there's this thing. Okay, so there are two, uh, at least two forward evolutions of this type. Um, what does this statement say? Uh, if you, um, it tells you how close the one-sheeted and the, uh, the one-sheeted and the two-sheeted expanders are as they approach the cone. So the uh, the, the asymptotic expansion tells us the following. So a surface is a rotation, what do these things look like? So the, the one-sheeted expander is this, and the, uh, the two-sheeted expander is not, is not all, um, well, it actually, it is the graph of a function. It just, it has infinite derivative here. Okay, so this is the, And I say two-sheeted expander because you're supposed to imagine another one over here. And this is the one-sheeted. Both are asymptotic to this cone. And as x goes to infinity, they both have this exact same expansion. So they are, uh, so the distance between these, the distance between the two expanders is extremely small. Uh, small. It is, um, It is of order one over x to the n for any n, so that it goes faster than algebraic. They have ex because they have the exact same asymptotic expansion. In fact, they go like e to the minus x squared with some coefficients. Um, okay, so the next question is: We have such expanders. So for which? So here I assume that uh, I didn't prescribe the cone. I said, suppose that I have one of these, ex these expanders. It's asymptotic to a cone. And then for that cone, we have the situation. Now the question is, for which number, which numbers A can I put here? OK, so in other, in other words, so remember this. What is, the, what is this little A? This little A, that's this distance. OK, so for each, for each uh, so it's, it's the radius of the neck of the one-sheeted expander. If you prescribe this little a, then there exists exactly one expander, uh, and it will have uh, some asymptotic slope. Uh, how does that asymptotic slope depend on this, uh, this a?
Um, okay, so lemma. This is also one of the properties of these things. Uh, so first of all, it's differentiable. And second, the limit as a goes to zero of is infinite. So the graph looks like this. It actually, it, so from what I've written here, it's a, um, the opening angle, depending on the, the uh, radius of the neck, is um, uh, depending on little a, is a function that is it's continuous, it's differentiable, it becomes infinite here and becomes infinite there. And then, so a priori, it could look like this. Um, but then you can calculate these things numerically and it looks like it. So I'll, I'll write that dotted. So we didn't actually prove that it is concave, or convex, or anything, but it has. Uh, uh, there is a minimum value. So consequence. There is an a star positive, so that. Okay, so if this is the minimum value a star, then uh, if you pick any a bigger than that, there will be at least two, and possibly more if the graph is, happens to be exotic, which it really it isn't. Uh, but so um, you should be able, so the theorem, this should be true if you delete the word a at least, right? The, if you replace it by exactly, but that's, um, okay. So how many forward evolutions do we have then? I could try to draw it here in the three-dimensional picture, but that would become a big mess. Sorry? You mentioned it's not known if it's complicated. No, it is not known if it has, so it has exactly one minimum. That's numerically verified, but it's not, not proved. No, and I, and I don't know whether it would be hard or not. It's, the thing is, it's a statement about this one particular ODE so it's, uh, so it's, I'm, I'm convinced that it is true, and if, uh, if it ever becomes important, then uh, you know, if we really have to prove it, uh, a numerically you know, machine precision or the interval arithmetic program would be able to verify that. Um, so, what expanders do we have from this cone? First of all, there is the evolving it forward in the two-sheeted way using the ecker huskin theorem. And then now, uh, if, this, if this aperture A is bigger than that A star, there are two self-similar one-sheeted ways of uh, going forward. One is uh, this, and then the other is this. Okay, so there are two, at least two of them going forward. Um, the viscosity solution uh, will be the whole region in between the, the outer ones. And this, this one will be lying somewhere inside the viscosity solution. Uh, the level set flow. Um, this A star is so I don't know the number of A, the value of A star, I know this angle. So it's an, so this angle, if we call this alpha, then A is the tangent of alpha. It's about 66 degrees. Uh, from, just from numerical computations. Um, okay, so. Now from the point of view of just studying mean curvature flow as a mathematical, uh, unless you, a mathematical, uh, 
thing of interest, you could ask a, a very natural question uh, is, can I find a smooth surface uh, that forms a singularity, and when it forms a singularity, its singularity is, uh, is a cone like this, and the aperture, the opening of the cone, is so large that we can then flow it forward using this. And so for uh, mean curvature flow in three dimensions, that is, I think, is still an open uh, problem. We have numerical evidence that you can. Uh, instead of presenting you the numerical evidence, I would like to um, give you a different uh, perspective. Uh, also, so there are these two flows, Ricci flow and mean curvature flow, uh, that are being studied and that are, have uh, a large number of similarities. Uh, one difference, I think, is that um, Ricci flow, I think it's safe to say, it's fair to say that it has been much more successful in actually uh, producing topological theorems. I mean, the Poincaré conjecture and the geometrization theorem are uh, enormous successes. Um, on the other hand, the mean curvature flow, I think, is closer to mathematical physics and has more applications. So there are, so there are other reasons to look at mean curvature flow. So I want to, so there's a paper by Riston Part. Et al. Nature, a couple of years ago, I think it's 2011, give or take one or two years. Um, so, they did, so they are physicists, not even theoretical physicists. They, they have a lab with, uh, so they had the following setup. You have a tube, in this tube you have two liquids, so, and I forgot what they are. So there's one liquid here, uh, there's the other liquid is up here, and then they, somebody throws in a drop of this, of liquid number one. So let's say this is oil. I'll say they're oil and water, but they weren't. So not oil and not water, um, just to label them. Uh, they throw in a drop of this, and that drop falls down, and at some point it hits this surface, and then it, it, uh, they, they, it gets absorbed. Um, and what they did to make this more uh, interesting is that they put an electric field. And so they observed the following. If the electric field was small, then um, what happened is uh, so let me not draw the whole setup, let me just draw this surface and that surface. So E small, what they observed is that right, and these are snapshots in a movie. The drop falls, um, this surface goes up a little bit, and it, this thing, they, uh, they merge, uh, this thing smooths out, and it just becomes a, a surface like that. When the uh, electric field is really large, what happens is that the drop falls, it gets close, um, and it bounces off the surface. And then they spend, uh, they spend time on trying to explain why this happens. Uh, and I believe, um, I believe they came to, to the conclusion that there is no way to explain this using surface tension only. Um, and it was, so surface tension is captured by the energy in the surface, it's, uh, so which is proportional to the area. Uh, <clears throat> if you assume that the surface tension, so uh, surface tension would be important at this moment where the two surfaces connect, right? So what happens here? Do these, do these two surfaces, uh, there's a, there's a, it's like in Takis's drawing, these two surfaces touch, do they, uh, does this neck, does it, for, does it form a neck and, and widen, or does it separate again? Um, so surface tension would, uh, so an explanation by surface tension would be to say that the thing tries to reduce its area as much as possible. Uh, in other words, near, uh, so 
at the time that this happens in a short neighborhood in space and time, the evolution of the boundary between oil and water is governed by mean curvature flow. Can you give an explanation for this using that? And the answer, uh, so Peter Topping and Sebastian Helmensdorfer. came up with an explanation, and it's, it's, it's exactly this. Uh, so what happens in this situation, so remember there's an electric charge here, and what that does um, is um, when these things get negative, so a fair amount of positive charge uh, ends up on the surface of this uh, over here. There's no charge here. Uh, this thing develops. So this positive charge attracts all the negative charge here and moves the positive charges to the other side. And right before, before these things touch, uh, there's positive charge here, negative charge here, and that's why, that's why this surface is coming up. It's because there's an electrical attraction from the drop on the surface, right? And, uh, but the attraction is not very strong, so when they touch, if you, when they touch, at the moment of contact, these surfaces will be more or less conical, and the opening angles of these cones will be really large. Right? This angle, so this angle and this angle will be really large. So that means we are well above, well above the 66 degrees required for there to be more, to, to be, for there to be one sheeted expanders. Okay, so when that happens, um, under mean curvature flow, this thing would, uh, one forward evolution, and um, so you would have to check that it's the one that reduces the area the fastest. That's a good question for someone to look into. Um, the forward evolution of this would be uh, something like that, which is what they saw over here. On the other hand, if the electric field is really strong, then this attraction is very strong, and uh, that would cause the shape of the two surfaces, when they collide, to be uh, also conical, but with a much smaller angle. If this angle is really small, then under mean curvature flow, there is only one way forward, namely to, um, for this thing to separate. Okay, what happens at this particular moment? Why do we have mean curvature for flow uh, starting here, and why didn't that happen before? Because under mean curvature flow, uh, when a neck pinches, uh, the singularity is not conical. It's, uh, it's more cusp-like. It's, it's like a cone with a zero degree angle. Um, so why did we not have this for, uh, for negative values of t, if this is t is zero? It's because right up to the moment of contact, everything was being driven by these electrical charges, and then at the moment of contact, uh, there is a current, the charges get equalized, and the electrical field does not play any role anymore. Okay, so this is, um, so in mathematics, you might want to have mean curvature flow hold always and start with a smooth surface. In nature, uh, nature can set things up so that you have one, uh, you know, one set of laws up to a particular moment, and then once you've prepared the initial value, mean curvature flow takes over. Which I thought was a nice, uh, a nice application of these ideas. Um, okay, so I, I spent more time on this. So tomorrow, what I want to do is um, uh, talk about um, solutions in uh, in Rn. where you regard Rn as Rp cross Rq. So, so far we have, today we've been looking at R3 is R cross R2, and we assume rotational symmetry in either of these two factors. So here we had reflection symmetry in R and rotational symmetry in the plane. Tomorrow we'll assume rotational symmetry in this and that factor. Um, and you get, uh, you get a much richer uh, family of examples 
Um, and I also want to talk about non-self-similar things which are more PDE uh, oriented. So there will be examples of solutions that start out smooth, form a singularity, and then have many different ways of going forward. Um, in particular, there are, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, so 